It is my pleasure to introduce you guys the senior IT uh, guy from Victor Ops in Boulder, Colorado. How about a nice big round of applause for Mike Meredith? Hi, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Mike Meredith. I'm the senior director of IT for Victor Ops in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we're an alert management and collaboration platform. Uh, for on-call teams. Uh, we work with uh, Nagios and with other monitoring platforms. Uh, but the monitoring tool of choice for us at Victor Ops is Nagios, uh, and we manage it with Puppet. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that today. And uh, hey, uh, gonna be talking a little bit about why uh, we use config management in general, um, a bit about kind of the technique of using Puppet with Nagios, and then I've prepared a little bit of a demo uh, for you guys to look at. And <clears throat> the demo will be available in a, in a uh, GitHub repository that you'll be able to download and, and play around with uh, after if, if this is interesting to you. Uh, so why config management? Um, you know, I, I assume that uh, most of you are using a config management system or at least interested in config management. So I won't uh, belabor this point too much. Uh, but this is the age of virtualization, uh, and we're all managing hundreds of running OSs at this point. And it's just not practical uh, to spend your time logging in manually to each machine, trying to get the config the same on each machine, uh, and trying to control that, right? Uh, it's just it's too much work for a single person to do. So config management solves that. It also solves the problem of configuration drift and inconsistency. Uh, because you don't have to remember every single place that config goes. Your clients are checking in, they're grabbing the configs themselves. So you push something out, uh, a change to one of your web servers, you know that it's gonna get to all of your web servers. Uh, it makes your systems a lot easier to build and a lot easier to back up because unless you have proprietary data at rest on the system, you don't need to back it up, there's no point. It's a lot easier to just rebuild the system, re-image it, Reprovision it with your config management system, and you're off to the races. Uh, it's also a, uh, a key enabling technology for DevOps. I would say that it's the key enabling technology for DevOps. And at VictorOps, uh, we're a DevOps shop, so that's important to us. Uh, and what that means is it allows me to treat my infrastructure as code uh, and to use source code, man source code management uh, as an IT workflow tool. Um, you know, I, I, 10 years ago, I spent all my time in terminal windows and, and in VI editors doing things manually. And today, uh, my workday is radically different. I'm spending most of my time in a text editor on my desktop and checking in changes to source code uh, and, and managing my systems that way. Um, and that's great for a lot of reasons, uh, mainly uh, from a DevOps perspective, uh, because it, it, it's necessitated me learning source code management, and uh, learning about continuous integration, learning about unit testing and integration testing, and it's given me a lot more empathy uh, for the developers that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And by putting me kind of in their world, it's also given them a lot more empathy for what I spend my time doing, and given them the opportunity to make direct contributions, um, which you know I know is, is kind of a nightmare for a lot of people uh, to think about the idea of, of kind of handing your developers the keys and walking away. But source code management makes that sane. Config management makes that sane because you can handle things through pull requests. You've got reviewability. You can roll back changes that you don't like. Um, so if you're using Chef, that's awesome. If you're using Ansible or Salt or CF Engine, those are both, you know, all great tools. Uh, we use Puppet. and. Uh, for a lot of reasons which I can absolutely go into after the session if anybody's really curious. Um, but for what we're talking about today for Nagios management, management uh, there are a few key features in Puppet uh, that make it easy for us. Uh, exported resources, Hira, inline templates, Factor, uh, native Nagios resource types, and the Puppet Forge. Uh, and just to kind of go through those uh, quickly, an exported resource uh, is a resource that gets defined on one host, uh, but implemented on another host. And this is absolutely key to what we're doing here, um, because you, 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 you don't have to use some sort of shared storage, or you don't have to use some sort of uh, file transfer in order to get information from one host to another. Um, you know, uh, It requires the use of PuppetDB, 
uh, which means for practical purposes that you need to have a, a puppet master. A lot of people like to run masterless uh, puppet deployments, and this approach isn't really gonna work uh, for that. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, here's kind of what an exported resource looks like. On the host that's generating the resource, here we've got, you see the uh, add at in front of the resource declaration. Say I'm gonna define a Nagio service. It's gonna be an HTTP check service and so on. Uh, so the client instantiates that service, stores it to the puppet DB, but doesn't do anything else to it. Now on the Nagio server, when it does its puppet run subsequently, it says, hey, I, I want to instantiate any Nagio services that have been exported with the tag that I'm looking for in particular. Uh, and it creates them on, its, on itself. Uh, so that's kind of how that works. We'll see more about that uh, in a bit. Uh, Hira is a hierarchical data store that goes along with Puppet. Um, and it allows you to separate your code from your data. Uh, and what that means is you know, IP addresses, passwords, anything like that that's likely to change over time or that's gonna be different from one environment to the next or from a lo one location to the next. It stays out of your source code. It's in a separate place. It's managed separately. Uh, and, uh, and so it's kind of easier to find what you're looking for, easier to manage that, easier to keep it secure. Um, it's hierarchical, which means that you can set defaults for values and then provide overrides on an environment basis, on a location basis, or on an individual host basis if you need that. It's very flexible. Uh, it supports several backends, uh, including an encrypted YAML backend you, if you want to use that. And that's an extra layer of security. So if your source code repository gets stolen, uh, then at least the, the data that's in Hira is not so easily accessible. It decreases your attack surface uh, for your source code repository. <clears throat> Inline templates are, are a function that's available in Puppet code, uh, and it's a great way to create little one or two line files or to add a line or two uh, to an existing file, uh, but they're also handy uh, in that uh, Puppet doesn't have some of the advanced uh, string manipulation, array manipulation functionality uh, that's available in, in native Ruby code. And inline templates allow you to sneak little snippets of native Ruby code into your Puppet policy and get around some of those limitations. You'll see an example of that later. Uh, Factor is a program that comes along with Puppet uh, and it runs on each client system and it uh, uses Ruby libraries to gather facts from the system things like your fully qualified domain, domain name, things like your IP addresses, uh, whether or not you're a virtual machine, what your hypervisor technology is if you are, uh, all those sorts of things. And it makes them available to your public policy as global scope variables. Uh, and you can extend that pretty easily with Ruby libraries if you've got some sort of custom fact that you want it to be able to discover. You just write a little Ruby script that's gonna output the, uh, uh, the right value for the fact that you wanna look up. Nagios resource types, Puppet has native support for this. Uh, although I'll note uh, that uh, from what I hear, this, this uh, is gonna get externalized. It's gonna be taken out of the core uh, Puppet product and moved into a, a loadable module. Um, but it's still gonna be available. Uh, and what this means is, is uh, makes creating the Nagios config simple and enforces correct syntax uh, because your configs are being programma programmatically generated. It's not suitable for every kind of config and every kind of config file. Uh, and so for the method that I'm outlining here, I use a little bit of both. But it's very handy for especially dynamic resources that might be coming and going. Um, the Puppet Forge is a public repository of Puppet modules that you can add to your Puppet code for additional functionality. Those can be uh, libraries, they can be defined resource types, uh, or they can be classes. Um, so an example, uh, Puppet Labs themselves distributes uh, an Apache module. If you install it in your Puppet policy, it's easy to call it. It will install Apache on your server and configure it and manage the service. Uh, so it's a, just a great way of saving yourself hours of labor. If you've got a particular task you wanna do, you can go to the Puppet Forge and see if somebody else has already solved the problem for you. With the huge caveat, um, that these modules are not being evaluated by Puppet Labs. So just as you can uh, you know, upload a, a, a rootkit or a botnet 
uh, to GitHub and hope that people download it. Uh, you're perfectly free to upload a rootkit to the Puppet Forge and have other people install it in their Puppet policy. Uh, so it's up to you as a user uh, to review everything that you're, that you're downloading from the Forge, uh, to make sure that you trust the source, and just uh, go through the code and make sure that it's not doing anything that you're, that you're not expecting it to do. Um, so that said, there are several Nagios modules in the, in the Puppet Forge, uh, and I could have used one of those for, for Nagios management. Um, but uh, as we all know, Nagios is an extremely flexible uh, product. Puppet is also extremely flexible. And as a result, I didn't find one that was really kind of situated for the way I wanted to do things. Um, and uh, you know, some of the functionality that I was looking for, I wanted to automatically add new hosts uh, when they uh, check into the Puppet server. I wanted to provision service checks in other Puppet modules, not just in the Nagios module itself. Uh, I wanted to be able to automatically remove hosts from my Nagios config uh, when they get deactivated, and I want to make use of host and service groups just because I, I think that's handy. Um, so the approach that I'm going to talk about uh, will work great if you're Victor Ops, uh, and might work great for you too. Uh, if your servers have functional names, it'll work great. Uh, and by that I mean I tend to name my web servers things like web1 and web2, and I name my MySQL servers things like MySQL1 and MySQL2. So if you have those kind of functional naming conventions, uh, this is a great approach. Uh, if your environment is moderately dynamic, uh, this is a great approach, meaning that you're adding 5, 10, 20 hosts a week, uh, taking down 5, 10, 20 hosts a week. Uh, if you're managing every host and every service, with Puppet, uh, that's a huge plus. Um, you know, meaning everything that's capable of running Puppet is running it, it's checking into the master, uh, and it's keeping up with policy. And if you've got, I would say, tens to hundreds of nodes, uh, it's gonna scale pretty well for you. Uh, beyond that, I can't really make any promises. Um, if there's anybody here from uh, Netflix today, sorry, this is probably not gonna work great for you. If you're you know, building and tearing down hundreds or thousands of hosts a day, uh, this solution is just not going to keep up with that level of dynamism. Uh, and so you're probably going to have to look somewhere else. Uh, or if you're running thousands and thousands of nodes, um, you know, Puppet has some uh, well-known well scaling challenges. Uh, and you probably want to look beyond the core functionality of this module uh, for that. Uh, or if you have ad hoc services and hosts um, you know, like if uh, Jimmy from development comes to you tomorrow and says he needs a Nginx server, so you just stand up a box and you name it Grover, and he installs Nginx from source, and you have no idea what's going on there, this isn't going to be a great solution for you. Everything needs to be managed. Everything needs to be checking into the Puppet Master. So, talking about how it all comes together. Factor and Puppet Policy define the roles for each server. Uh, again, factors providing things like FQDN, IP address, virtual versus physical. Puppet policy looks at those facts and assigns roles based on them. And then profile classes are defined for each of those roles. So here's an example of our site PP configuration uh, for the demo environment that I'm using here. This is an excerpt from it. And you can see I'm looking at a regex of the uh, FQD in here, or actually the domain here, and I'm picking out that, that first stanza. If it's dev, then your VO environment is dev. If it's stage, then it's stage. Uh, same thing with location here, and, and I'm calling Vagrant a location, um, and you'll, you'll hear more about Vagrant in a bit, uh, and sets the VO location. Uh, and then uh, we go to the, uh, the host name itself, and then based on uh, reading that, we, we assign it a server type. So it's a Nagio server, a Puppet server, a web server, an HA proxy server, uh, so on and so on. OK, Hira is defining our variables. Uh, we're putting insane defaults for most values. We're in providing environment-specific overrides um, and site-specific overrides, uh, if it makes sense. Uh, here's what the main Hira configuration looks like. Uh, as you can see in the demo environment, we're just going to be using the plain text YAML backend. Uh, and this is just telling you where you can go and look for that. And then we've got our hierarchy defined. Uh, down at the bottom is defaults. 
Uh, so if we can find no other matching database, look in defaults and find your value there. If there's a database defined for your location as, as uh, described by that location variable, uh, that's gonna override default. The environment will override that. Environment and location together will override that. And then if there's a database for your FQDN, that's gonna override anything else. Um, as you can see, this is just a YAML file. It would be easy to reorganize that or base it on any variable you wanna base it on. It's extremely flexible. And here's an example of some of the hybrid data in that database. Uh, you know, you've got variables, you've got arrays, you've also got some access to uh, some limited functions within the HIRA database. Again, extremely flexible, extremely useful. Clients build their own configs. Each client figures out which host groups it belongs to. It builds an array of those host groups using an inline template. Uh, it uses other facts like uh, FQDN and IP address when it's setting up its own host definition. And then it builds its NRPE config from a common template. Uh, special services, I'm talking about uh, checks for Apache, checks for MySQL, uh, they get built uh, and embedded with the node's profile, uh, meaning uh, it's not configured in the Nagios module, it's con configured in the profile module where each host is getting its unique configuration. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, if you make a change to how your service is configured, or how many instances you've got running, you're probably gonna to wanna to make a change to how you're monitoring it. So it's handier if that's all in the same place, and you just make those changes at the same time, they roll out at the same time, they take effect at more or less the same time. Uh, common service definitions are templatized. So there are some things uh, that we monitor pretty much the same on all hosts. We you know, look for swap utilization, uh, root file system utilization, those sorts of things we tend to watch those pretty much the same way everywhere we watch them. So we make a single template for that, just so that we don't have too many pieces and parts floating around. Uh, and that's uh, you know more configuration in a single place, a little bit easier to debug than some of the other techniques that we're gonna be using here. Um, the dynamic files get built with every puppet run. Um, and then uh, built in a temporary directory and then I compare those files to what's running, and only if there's a difference do I move them into place and restart the Nagios instance. Um, and the reason I do that is because the Nagios native resource types in Puppet don't really have a purge functionality. Uh, they can add Nagios configuration objects to files, but they can't really remove Nagios configuration objects from files. So this is how I achieve the goal of having a host disappear from my Nagios configuration when it gets deactivated. If it's not checking in, if it's been deactivated, uh, then it's gonna disappear from the Puppet database and the next time the Nagios server does its config build, it's not gonna be in there. Um, a quick note on how you would actually monitor Puppet, it's not too complicated. On the Puppet Master, you wanna watch your Apache process, you wanna watch your Puppet DB process if you're running the the uh, Postgres backend for that, you're gonna wanna monitor Postgres. Uh, and then if you're running a uh, front end like Puppet Dashboard or Foreman, you're gonna wanna monitor that too. Uh, on the client, the main thing that I do is I watch for this last run summary.yaml uh, that lives in var lib puppet state, I believe. And uh, I just make sure that that file gets touched every half hour or so. That's the usual run interval for uh, a Puppet agent. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't actually parse that file and, and look for failures or anything like that. Uh, I think there are better ways of monitoring for that sort of thing. Um, maybe a Nagios log server, for example. Um, I'm actually probably gonna be looking into that. Um, so to describe my Linux, uh, my, my demo environment here, uh, I'm running uh, Ubuntu 14.04 LTS. Uh, I'm running Puppet Community version 3.7.1, that's the latest and greatest, uh, and uh, Nagios Core 3.5.1, just because that's stock on uh, Ubuntu 14.04, and I wanted to kind of make it as simple as possible. This is using Vagrant, uh, and if you don't know about Vagrant, you should leave here and immediately find out about Vagrant. It is awesome, it is a great way of testing puppet code or really anything else that you're working on uh, because it allows you to very rapidly instantiate 
not just virtual machines, but whole collections of virtual machines, whole little uh, networks uh, that interact uh, together in, in a way that's described in the Vagrant file. Um, the demo environment is available, again, in, on GitHub. Uh, GitHub.com slash VictorOps slash Puppet dash Nagios. Uh, and uh, that URL will uh, appear later. And uh, contains everything you need uh, to get this demo up and running. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to flip over and show you. So Vagrant status just shows you the status of all the virtual machines that you're running. As you can see, I've got a Puppet server, a Nagios server, uh, one of two web servers running, two MySQL servers, and an HA proxy server. And if we go over to uh, Chrome here, uh, you can see on Foreman um, that those guys are, you know, everybody that's uh, up and online right now is uh, checking in regularly and getting their Puppet policy. They've all checked in within the last few minutes here. Uh, you can see that uh, HA proxy is humming along. It's happy. It's got its web server behind it. And then if you look at Nagios, here's all my hosts uh, and all of my services that I've got configured. Uh, now, say I want to add a, uh, another web server to my farm. Uh, great. Er, that one's already up. <laughs> web 2. Uh, so as this guy boots up, um, you know, and starts up its puppet agent, it's going to check out the puppet policy uh, and do a run, and that's going to let the uh, puppet database know, hey, this, you know, this host is back in business um, and it's updating its policy, and so it'll get re-added to the uh, uh, to the puppet database. Um, just for kicks, I'm going to do a manual puppet agent run to make absolutely sure. But flipping over to here, if we do a reload here, we should see our Web2 host. Uh, it's saying it checked in 14 minutes ago because it's not quite done with its current policy run. Let me run that again. <coughs> And now if we go on our Nagios host, oh, already running. Watch here for when it's done with its run. and go back here, it will have uh, restarted, and there's my new host. Uh, it exported its own host description. It exported uh, the check for HTTP, for Apache 2, uh, and the puppet agent check. The rest of it was all uh, uh, assigned to the all host group. Uh, so that's great. Um, and for kicks, you can also see um, that our HA proxy server is also using exported resources uh, to build its HA proxy config. Um, so when it gets done running, uh, you'll see the other web server uh, join the, uh, the load balancer pool there. And there it goes. So uh, let's say now we decide that we've got too many web servers. Um, so let's take down web one. Again, Vagrant makes all of this just extremely easy. <clears throat> uh, so that guy shut down. Uh, and if we, uh, yeah, we can see on HA proxy that it's already complaining about it. Uh, and we can see, uh, or we will be able to see in a minute or two, uh, that Nagios will start noticing that it's absent. Um, Web well, one there. And, and the, also that the HA proxy service is no longer happy. Uh, so the, the solution to this, 
If we know that this, this host is going to be down for a while, uh, or we know that it's been decommissioned, we just have to get on the uh, puppet node, uh, and we have to deactivate it. Puppet node deactivate, and then the uh, FQDN of the host. It's not deleting the host uh, from the puppet database. It's not revoking the certificate uh, or anything like that. It's basically just marking it as deactivated. And when the resource collector goes through next time, it's going to say, OK, that host is deactivated. Uh, it's no longer relevant to me, uh, so I'm not going to put it in my config. So we'll run the, the uh, puppet agent on Nagios 1 again. While we're at it, we'll run it on our HA proxy. That's the ugly hack part. And now, web one is gone. Web two is still there. Uh, HA proxy is. once again happy, so the next time we schedule a uh, service check there, it's going to be happy too. Refresh, refresh, we've all done this. There we go. <clears throat> and there you have it. And then, uh, you know, if we get to a point where we decide that we want that Web1 server back, uh, no problem. That's all I have to do. I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to touch my Nagios config. I don't have to touch my HA proxy config. Uh, it's going to start exporting its resources again, and it's going to get automatically picked up uh, by, the, uh, by the server. So let's have a quick look at some of the actual code that we're dealing with here. It's fairly readable. Um, so we enter our public policy at site PP. You saw an expert, excerpt of this earlier. Uh, and you can see we define ourselves based on environment. We define ourselves based on location. And we define ourselves based on server type. And then we hand off to the common module. I don't do any other uh, node classification uh, for my own part. I like to handle that all. Uh, this way. So we go to our common module and we say, okay, if you're, if you're not just starting up from the first time from Vagrant and you're a Nagios server, then go load up the Nagios server uh, module and, and do whatever it tells you to do. Uh, if you're a database server, you need to load the DB server profile. If you're a web server, you need to load the uh, web server profile, and so on and so on. And then everybody gets uh, class puppet run interval display limit. Um, our profiles look something like this. Here's the profile for a web server. Class Apache, uh, that's again the uh, Puppet Labs Apache module uh, from the Forge. And that's really uh, about all it takes to get Apache installed, configured, and running uh, on a system using that, using that module. Um, we export our HA proxy config. We're a balancer member. Uh, we export our Nagios service config for the HTTP service. We export the Nagios config for the Apache 2 process. And then we stick a little file in uh, nrpe.d for check Apache. And here's an inline template. Just stick that in the file. Off you go. Um, going into the uh, VO Nagios uh, module itself, uh, and this is where the magic happens, I guess. Uh, if, you're a, uh, if you're a target, if you're a client, you're going to load the uh, target class there. Um, and you're going to install NRPE. You're going to install the templatized NRPE config. Um, and uh, that template just looks like this. It's a, you know, a basic ERB template. Uh, we don't do much with it. You, you can. Uh, if you're a defined server type, 
add specific checks in there for that, and that's a fine way to do that if you don't want to use the nrpe.d method. Um, and then you can also uh, set things like, uh, you know, nrpe allowed hosts. That's a variable that it's going to grab from Hira. Uh, so you don't have to have a different template for uh, every environment and for every location. Um, part of target is figuring out what host groups it belongs to. Uh, so again, we've got a few base host groups defined. Uh, we set a host group based on the environment we belong to, based on the location that we belong to. Um, if we're Ubuntu, we call ourselves an Ubuntu server. If we're a virtual server, we call ourselves a virtual server. And then we go through, uh, we, we match if we're a di different server types, and then we use this other inline template. This is where we've, where I had to make use of, of Ruby's native, uh, uh, actually hash uh, manipulation uh, routines because uh, Puppet itself wouldn't do it for me. Uh, but it basically just makes a long array of all of the host groups that you belong to. And then when it's uh, creating its uh, host definition from itself, um, it's grabbing that array and plugging that in there. As you can see, use via env host, meaning if you're a dev host, you're using the dev host generic host definition um, and, and uh, alias is a shortened uh, host name address uh, is our IP address from ETH1. ETH1 because we're running in Vagrant, uh, that's kind of a Vagrantism. Um, and that's the basic gist. So again, uh, the demo environment is available on GitHub slash Victor Ops slash Puppet Nagios. Uh, please check it out. Uh, if you feel like it uh, and it looks suitable for your environment and you want to hack on it, uh, contribute or fork. Uh, that's fine. I, I just hope you get some use out of it. Uh, and if you like, I've, I'm trying to uh, do some work on this to, to make it a kind of Puppet Forge worthy module. Uh, understanding, I said before, that really anything is a Puppet Forge worthy module. Uh, but that meets kind of the standards of reusability. So um, that's a more parameterized module that supports more Nagios versions, that supports uh, operating systems other than Ubuntu Linux, and that has uh, unit tests and better documentation. Uh, I would uh, welcome any contributions, any pull requests that anybody wants to make. Um, and if you uh, have any questions or anything like that, please feel free to email me, find me on Twitter. Uh, and I will uh, do anything I can to answer any questions you've got. Uh, or right now, uh, does anybody have any questions? You're that much of a linguistic that you covered everything? I yeah. explained it perfectly. He did it so amazingly. <laughs> All right, perfect. We got some in the back. All right, so I have a question about scalability. Yeah. Because you mentioned that, like, where do you currently see your pain, pain points? Like, how big is too big? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And I think, uh, you know, I would say this, this solution probably scales about as well as an individual Nagio server, um, and, and probably not much beyond that. Um, that said, uh, the approach that we take at VictorOps is for different data centers, we run a, a Nagios server uh, in each location. So, uh, you know, we kind of divide up the work uh, that way, and that would allow you to scale, you know, if you took that approach, you could scale horizontally, uh, you know, pretty much without limit, uh, with the caveat that you've got to find some way of tying all the output of those uh, Nagios servers together. I've got a question about um, tying Puppet DB together. You mentioned you've got multiple data centers. Mm -hmm. Do you worry, do you have different security zones? So the reason I haven't done Puppet and Nagios generating it using Puppet DB is because I've got remote data centers and I don't necessarily trust that data to come back to my, my master source machine. Mm -hmm. Do um, you differentiate that way or just assume everything is good? I, I pretty much have the, the same answer again, which is that for each location that I've got, uh, I've got a, a Puppet Master server. 
And so the, the Puppet database is different uh, for each location, and there isn't any uh, data that has to traverse a WAN link. And so part of your Puppet config comes from your central GitHub, and then you generate some on each local Puppet master. Is that kind of that idea? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've got a, a central uh, repository that's got all of our Puppet policy uh, for covering all of our locations, uh, including uh, policy for setting up and managing uh, a Puppet server. So it's pretty trivially easy just to download that, do a Puppet apply on the server that you want to be your Puppet master, uh, and then you know that environment is bootstrapped. Everybody else just has to check into that guy, uh, and, you've, you know, and you've got a running environment. And so the Nagios-related puppet configs are dynamically generated for that particular puppet master, right? Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah, okay. exactly. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I saw you uh, removing the server and adding the server, mm -hmm. um, but you didn't reload the Nagios uh, configuration. Uh, how is that? Uh, the the uh, uh, puppet agent manages that itself. Once it, once it builds the config, um, it compares it to the config that's running, and if there's a difference, it'll copy those files in, and then it'll uh, send a restart to the Nagios team. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions? Um, is it, would it be difficult to uh, incorporate some ad hoc configuration either on the Puppet server or on the Nagio server? Um, not at all, and we do a little bit of that, of that here. In fact, if you look at the, uh, the files section of my uh, Nagios module, um, I actually have the, uh, you know, the confd directory in there, uh, and there are some services, like I said, they're assigned to host group all, so these are services that I'm, that I'm monitoring everywhere and they're just stuck in a file, and that file just gets copied in. Um, so we can, you know, you can certainly put whatever ad hoc services you want in there. Over to the bottom. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then these, uh, you know, the, uh, the dynamic files, uh, they go into Etsy Nagios 3 objects, uh, which is a totally different directory, and that, you know, so the dynamic stuff all lives in there. Everything else lives in conf.d. Um, hey, so firstly, it was a very nice demo. Um, and Thank you. The, the question is, you've said that um, you're looking for help to make it work on various other systems. So naturally, I can understand it would work differently on Windows, if you can call that an operating system. <laughs> but um, why would it vary between, let's, let's say, um, Debian or Ubuntu or RHEL or CentOS, apart from maybe paths for the packages? Um, and that's really all it is. You know, that, that's, that's really a pretty minor effort. We're just talking about package names, path names, uh, right, names so of the running processes. So it's just that, right? Like uh, instead of Apache, HTTPD, and paths for it and so forth. Yeah, it's generally just a matter of adding a few case statements so that you're calling the right path for, for the operating system that you're on. Right, so I figured, well, um, I'll try to find time to help. It's a very nice project. Oh, thank you very much. Good luck. Any additional questions? All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you put your hands together one more time for Mike Meredith. Thank you.